Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Britton Trice with Garden District Bookshop, and I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, we're really excited about having our, our two guests here tonight, our esteemed author, Edward Ball, and our esteemed um, moderator, uh, Dr. Michael Lomax. And we're here to uh, celebrate the publication of Edward's newest book, Life of a Klansman, and discuss that. And uh, it's been a long time since uh, Edward was in New Orleans. I guess we did a, a book signing for him. God, how many years ago was Slaves in the Family, Edward? More than 20, more than 20 uh, years it's ago. It's been a while. But uh, yeah. bookstore, bookstores, we're on our 40th year now. So uh, we are holding on amid the, the COVID <laughs> crisis and switching over to all, to all our events being virtual. Uh, instead of our, our usual uh, in-store events. So that's been a, a change for us, but uh, it seems to be going well. And we appreciate everybody here, being here tonight. Uh, so first, let me uh, explain how this will go. Michael and uh, Edward will be in conversation with each other. And there's a, if you will yes. notice on the menu of your Zoom menu, there's a mm -hmm. chat button. So if anyone has questions, they can feel free to chat, to type the questions into the chat room. And we will get to the, I'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, and I've also posted in that chat room, uh, for those, any of you who are interested in purchasing the book, I, per, I posted a link that will go directly to our website's uh, order page for, for Edward's newest book. So let's get on with the introductions. And mm -hmm. anyway, uh, Dr. Michael Lomax, since, 19, since 2004, has served as the president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, the nation's largest private provider of scholarships and other educational support to African-American students and a leading advocate of college readiness. Students need for an education from preschool through high school that prepares them for college success. And under his leadership, UNCF has raised more than $3 billion and helped more than 110,000 students earn college degrees and launched careers. <laughs> Annually, UNCF's work enables 60,000 students to go to college with UNCF scholarships and attend its 37 member historically black college universities and college and universities. And before uh, joining UNCF, Dr. Lomax was president <laughs> of Dillard University here in New Orleans and a literature professor at both Morehouse and Spelman colleges. He also founded the National Black Arts Festival and was a founding member um, of the Smithsonian Institution, Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and has served as chairman of the Fulton County Commission in Atlanta, the first African American elected to that post. Michael, welcome to our event tonight. Thank you, Britt. And I'm excited to welcome uh, Edward Ball, our author tonight. Edward was born in Georgia and raised in the South and worked in New York as an art critic. And Edward's previous mm -hmm. books include mm -hmm. The Inventor and the Tycoon, about the birth of moving pictures in California, and Slaves in the Family, an account of his family's history as slaveholders in South Carolina, and Edward's search for the descendants of his ancestors' slaves. Slaves in the Family received a National Book Award for nonfiction, and it really changed the American conversation about race. He has taught at Yale University and has been awarded fellowships by the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard and the New York Public Library's Coleman Center. He's also the recipient of a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Edward, welcome back to New to Garden District Bookshop. Thank you very much. It's good to be with I'm you. Turn this over to you too. So, welcome, welcome again. Thank you very much, Britton. It's great to be back in New Orleans, even if just virtually. I would much prefer to be there in person. I'm sure Edward would as well. Uh, and it's great to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you, Edward. Uh, when I was president of Dillard, I reviewed uh, Slaves in the Family for the Times Picayune. And I've been lucky in the, I don't do a lot of reviews, but I did get to review and, and uh, that. And I, the, the other wonderful book I got to review was uh, President Obama's, well, he was just Barack Obama at the time, Dreams of My Father. I got a first edition that he has signed. So that has oh. made me a very lucky uh, book reviewer. But uh, <clears throat> your uh, first book uh, that I read, Slaves in the Family, meant so much to me and to my family because we have deep roots in South Carolina, close associations with the Balls and some of the uh, um, uh, 
other families related. And so it was very helpful in our family uh, genealogy. So thank you. Uh, you know, this is a, a we're going to get into uh, Klansman pretty quickly, but these are such different books. Oh. And, you know, uh, uh, Klansman is a very, very in your face, tough book about the South. Yeah. What happened between, you know, slaves in the family and Klansmen that got, you know, that changed your perspective or did your perspective change? <laughs> Well, a similarity between my first book, Slaves in the Family, which was published in 1998, um, and this book, Life of a Klansman, is that both excavate family histories. Uh, in this case, my mother's family are the family under scrutiny, and my mother's people have been in New Orleans for about 175 years. And this book tells the story of one of them in uh, the mid 1800s. Slaves in the family told the stories of several hundred African-Americans and several dozen white people in my father's family in South Carolina. They're both family histories. They both try to look with clear eyes at their times and the racial content, if you like, of, of history and the racial content of the mentalities of families, white and black. So there, I think there's some similarities here, but uh, it is true that this book is uh, somewhat more difficult. It doesn't have as much redemptive hope as uh, my first book, Slaves in the Family, which promised that by talking to one another, whites and blacks could perhaps come to some agreement or common narrative about the past. And this book seems to um, suggest that it, it's more difficult than, than a single conversation. Well, you know, it's interesting that you would say blacks and whites maybe find a common narrative. And I think we did with Slaves of the Family. I mean, you know, if you were in the family, you know, you were in the big house or the little house, but you were still, you know, somehow or another related. This one is very much about uh, Creoles, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, and, 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 and so I, I, one for me, it's sort of like, you know. Uh, Creoles of color. You, well, yeah, but can you find a common narrative with white whites in this? Because the, the story you're telling is is a very hard one, I would imagine, uh, yeah. because it, it removes all of the sort of the gauze from, from the attitudes of whites toward black people and toward enslavement and control. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm briefly going to summarize the content of this book because it might help. Uh, it tells the story of a great, great grandfather of mine. His name is Constant Lecorn, Constant Lecorn, who was a Francophone, French-speaking man born in the 1830s to um, an immigrant from France in New Orleans and to a, a, a woman in a slaveholding family whose uh, status in the old antebellum South was in a period of decline. And this man, Constant Le Corne, uh, grows up in a creolized New Orleans, which is divided into parts. I mean, one quarter French speaking whites, Creoles, whites, one quarter English speaking Americans recently arrived from, from the East, one quarter enslaved African Americans, one quarter free people of color, many of whom were speaking French. So it's, it's a kaleidoscopic society. And he grows up um, poorly educated in 
um, the neighborhood of Bouligny, which is near the Mississippi River the, at Napoleon Avenue, for those who know New Orleans. And he uh, becomes a carpenter, a manual laborer, and uh, goes into uniform during the Civil War, along with 40,000 other uh, Louisiana white men. And he returns to New Orleans after three years to four years to uh, a period of um, disappointment and resentment. And he, um, at the conclusion of the Civil War, as, as those who have examined Louisiana history will attest, there is uh, a fascinating struggle that we call Reconstruction in which uh, African Americans are attempting, new, newly emancipated black people, four million in number, are attempting to establish lives, economic security, and establish um, a position in education and establish citizenship. And Constant Lacorn, uh, who's by this time not well off, uh, enters a, one and then an, another white militia, the resistance movement to reconstruction. And he becomes a fighter in the Ku Klux Klans. And that's the, the kernel of the story. Um, and it unfolds in a, a series of close up scenes of the uh, subversive attempt by white supremacists of the time. I, I think about this book as a, a kind of um, origin story for white supremacy. It tells the story of the birth and youth of white supremacy as a movement and ideology. And uh, it situates that story in New Orleans. Uh, a series of um, subversions that he undertakes and participates in to try to reverse the uh, growing power of African Americans in social life. And uh, ultimately, the Klan and its allies, we're talking about 150,000 white men throughout the Deep South, succeed in defeating Reconstruction and, and demoralizing the government in Washington, which decides to withdraw it's occupying troops from the South and from Louisiana, bringing an end to reconstruction and the establishment of Jim Crow segregation. So it, uh, in that sense, it, it is a, a, it's a dispiriting conclusion uh, to a story that we all hold in common. But what I hope is that by looking up close at the, the um, actions of one family and the lives of the people who struggled through that period, we might uh, apply some, be able to apply some medicine to the, the wound that the rise of white supremacy uh, incised across the South and incised across tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of families, white and black. Now you said a lot there. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I know that there are some questions emerging, and but I wouldn't. I just want to push a little bit. Um, you know, we've had people tell stories about the South. Some of the most uh, famous literature, uh, you know, uh, the town I'm in, I'm in Atlanta, y'all. So, you know, there's been a lot of Atlanta literature about the Civil War. And uh, the story that is, you know, from this town is Gone with the Wind, which is, uh, reflects the way a lot of people still think about uh, the war, the lost cause, the nobility of the slave owners, uh, the you know the harsh treatment that the 
uh, losing side endured, yet uh, arose victorious to create the New South. Um, your story is very different from that. Uh, you tell a story of a community which, um, you know, in, in so many different ways, um, brutalizes Black people, uh, brutalizes them with pseudoscience that says they're not really human beings to justify them not having the rights to vote. Uh, you tell some stories about um, massacres that I just didn't know about. I think I'm pretty well read. You know, 150 people killed in a massacre in one of the parishes. Uh, the Canal Street, uh, you know, some of the fight. So you tell really tough stories that most Americans, and I wonder how many New Orleans, New, New Orleanians actually know this history. Hmm. Yeah, well, um, the stories are there to be uncovered if you uh, decide to s browse the newspapers of the time. And much of this book is based upon public records of all sorts, court records, newspaper accounts, um, property records, um, uh, every manner of testimony that managed to find its way into the congressional record. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, the story is um, it is nonfiction. I, I, when I started to look at this man, uh, Constant de Corne, my ancestor, the Klansman, I initially thought to write a novel because I thought that it would be, oh, more attractive to the imagination but it was about 2015, the summer of 2015, after the so-called Charleston massacre at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church occurred, an event which for me was the door that opened the floodgates for the return of white supremacy to the public square in this country. And now uh, we're, living, we're floating on a river of white supremacist activity and thought uh, since then. When that occurred, I decided that it would be better to write a piece of nonfiction, a piece of history about Constant Le Corne. And uh, yes, we, we have the idea that New Orleans is the town of les élèves bon temps roulés and um, we let's can't we all get along uh, and um, nothing really matters um, but I think that that um, is a softening a gauzy um, view of our uh, history in New Orleans in fact what I discovered was that New Orleans was one of the birthplaces of white supremacist ideology, one of the places from which um, the kind of two and three tier uh, idea of citizenship and sp you know, even species, the inhabiting of species, one of the places where it was cultivated. It is one of the places where racial violence was perfected and perpetrated for many decades. And, and yet, I, I suppose there are reasons why one forgets. There are reasons why society forgets. And um, I, I believe in the um, therapeutic value of memory and restoration of, uh, restoration of narrative. Uh, and so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do with this, this book. So um, I see we've got a lot of questions emerging and maybe we could integrate some of the questions in because I don't want to, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna answer, be able to let, let you answer some of 
the, the questions. So do you want to do you want to do that, uh, Britton? Help us with that. You're on mute. Britton, you're on mute. There we go. Certainly, I'll be happy to uh, to ask a couple of questions. Um, uh, here's one from Anne de Farmer. Uh, this is part of the reason that this story is interesting is that it is about an urban family and how it interacts with a house slave culture. It is not the same as the plantation culture. I wanted to read this as it also hews close to my urban family history. So I'm curious. Um, I guess there's a question in there. Uh, yes, there? No, white, white folks and black folks that lived on top of each other ever since uh, enslavement and in New Orleans, just as in other uh, considerable southern cities like Charleston. Um, white folks and black folks have been cheek by jowl during enslavement and ever since. And uh, we, in, in historians' discourse, there's an overmuch focus on plantation society. And I agree that. Actually, I see that, Edward, that there was a, a follow, uh, I, there was an interruption in this question, and it goes on to say, so, says, so I'm curious, why did Gabrielle work as a porter and was not in the care of her children? Uh, Irene Rudain was listed as white in the 1940 census, which would make sense since her son would have had to gone to white high school to attend Tulane. Uh, where did he go to high school? I don't, I don't know where, where Irene Rudain's son went to high school, um, but there may be, someone on this chat who can tell us, uh, which is to say a man called Mark Rudinay, who, is, uh, who appears in this book. Um, you refer to a woman called Gabrielle. The book f revolves around Constant Lacorne, my great, great grandfather, our clansman, as I call him, his wife, was a woman named Gabrielle Duchemin, who was an orphan from uh, Cuba, French, a Francophone a French family who uh, she came to New Orleans and married this man in uh, 1856. And uh, they had, I believe they had nine children, five of whom survived into adulthood. And, uh, at the end of her life, Gabrielle Duchemin in 1905 is, uh, is uh, reduced to poverty. Uh, she's a white woman in, in uh, poverty and uh, she goes to work at an African-American school uh, as a porter. And this is, uh, this is at, in her mid seventies. And why she does it? Well, I think she needs work. Her children are grown and out of the house and this was the job set before her. So there's, as part of some of the reason for including that story is, is to underscore the, the ironies of, of historical reversal, what happens to uh, families in, um, who are, are dealing with unexpected circumstances. But that, that uh, historical reversal leads to some of the sense of, um, I, I get, I sensed in, in the way you were uh, telling these stories that that in some way accounted for the anger and the sense of outrage mm. that, that whites who had been on the top as God meant for them to be mm. were in this sort of post- Civil War period, yeah, uh, you know things had been turned topsy turvy, and uh, the sense of outrage and anger and determination uh, to right the world in which you know white a, a yeah. white woman would be serving black children as opposed to a black woman <clears throat> serving white children. serving white children, right? Yes, no, I I accept that it's. Uh, White Southerners in 1865, after the conclusion of the Civil War, experience 
themselves as a society that has been victimized. And a good minority of them turn their frustration into anger and rage directed at people whom they project their disfranchisement onto African Americans. It's as if uh, the loss has to be converted into some sort of aggression. And that's, uh, that's one psychological reading that one can make of many thousands of people whom one doesn't know personally. This is a reading that I accept, actually. And, oh, uh, and retribution, you know, and, uh, and right. righteous vengeance against that community, mm -hmm. which is expressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you're, unfor you're, you're very explicit about this in levels of violence against Black people that I don't, I wonder how much we really know that history. I mean, you're telling a history that doesn't get told very often. Yeah. Uh, and I just wonder how that would be received in, uh, and, and how that is being received in communities in the South where this is a, not the reading of a black historian, but a reading of, of, of a white historian. Yeah. There are some extraordinary papers that are collected in the Library of Congress from the late 1860s during the period of the first wave of the Ku Klux Klan. Congress uh, takes part in a series of investigations and invites hundreds to testify about their experience um, of uh, Klan violence. And these interviews are transcribed and collected in a thousand page uh, set of reports from 1868. And that volume alone uh, chronicles a thousand acts of, of violence in Louisiana that are that uh, a thousand acts that are, are hard to comprehend. And um, one just one has to look just beneath the the surface of myth to find some of the factual uh, truth telling that um, that I think is there. And, and no, it's true. I admit it. I'm not an African American historian. I mean, I'm not African American. I'm a historian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a surprise now. We did not know this. Okay. I just want to clarify. Okay. And um, Edward, um, David Grevenberg asked, uh, do you see this book as a call to action or providing a social license for Southern white men in particular to acknowledge the truths of white patriarchal superiority in the South as part of the wider journey towards understanding justice and reconciliation? Well, um, thank you, David Grevenberg, for that. Um, it's a, an optimistic and generous reading for what I've written. Uh, I, I do stand by, not to be redundant about it, but I do stand by the, um, the kind of therapeutic value of truth telling. Uh, and, um, and the therapeutic um, desire for restorative uh, justice. These are things that I, I believe in. And <clears throat> I, I, I think about a white supremacist violence as a, kind of a, a cancer that permeates the social body. Uh, the United States is shot through with, uh, with white supremacy and I think about a book like this as a kind of, <laughs> not to tax the metaphor, a kind of um, chemotherapy directed against that cancer. It's, uh, as you call it, Michael, it's tough. And, um, but the, the purpose is to, is to um, irradiate 
the cancer in an attempt to set the body's immune system back to rights uh, so that it can function better. So that's a metaphorical way of, of uh, thinking about it. And um, what's, what, is, what is interesting to me uh, at this moment is the, the way that stories in this book align with stories that have been unfolding in this country for the last two or three years, during which there's been a revival of uh, paramilitary white supremacy, uh, a spread of groups from the Proud Boys to the Michigan Wolverines to uh, a number of um, private uh, militias in Texas and in the Northwest that, that advocate uh, a white supremacist activity. And, and uh, unfortunately, in the past five years, about 250 people have died as a direct result of white supremacist violence. Some of the mass shootings in um, El Paso, Texas, and in Poway, California, and in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and in Cleveland, Ohio, are accompanied by manifestos written by uh, the perpetrators in which they elaborate views and values that are quite uh, in sync with those of my ancestor, our clansman, Constant Le Corn. So there's a kind of um, dialogue uh, between the stories and life of a clansman, I think, and events in the newspaper. So do you actually think that some of the you know, some of the bases for white supremacy, the pseudoscience of the 19th century, which found a home in New Orleans, the journalism of the period, which is very, very virulently anti-Black and which repeats and promotes a lot of the views of the, the white supremacists, the, the roles of the police and the fire departments and creating the militias which align with the uh, the clan, but also the uh, what is it the 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 other group which is the white camellia, which we don't hear as much about, but that seemed to have been a much more uh, Louisiana homegrown uh, uh, organization. A yeah. lot of that language is the language that you hear again today. So is this, is this just, do you think that people are something- Coincidence. Be, I'm sorry? It's coincidence. You think it's just coincidence? You don't no, it's not coincidence. No, I'm, I'm being ironic. No, it's not coincidence. Uh, it's it's um, startling how much the discourse of the 1860s, 1870s in white journalism is echoed in the discourse of the 20 teens and 2020 in certain corners of white uh, internet subculture. Uh, it's startling uh, and it's, it's not a coincidence. No, I, I, as I said, I think of this book in part as a, an origin story for white supremacy. It, it chronicles the emergence of this, this ideology of, of white superiority and how it is disseminated and how it inhabits the minds of tens of thousands, how it comes to inhabit the minds of tens of thousands of white families and take, makes, makes a home in the, in the mind. Uh, and uh, it, it, it appears that it um, becomes a semi-permanent feature of of the white unconscious, if you would allow me to use a, a bit of jargon, a semi-permanent feature. And uh, it is taken out and dusted off and mobilized um, by politicians uh, in subsequent generations, including in our own generation. And uh, conspicuously in, uh, in the last five years of uh, 
of US political discourse. So I wanna, one other thing that isn't, I mean, I sort of scratched my head. I was expecting maybe to find it in the book, but it isn't in the book, um, is another feature of what you think of as late 19th and uh, century um, interracial life in New Orleans, which is uh, uh, relationships between white men and women of color. And, uh, you know, there's, um, I, I was particularly interested because, you know, our, our stories intertwine a couple of ways. One is that your father's family is the South Carolina story, as is mine and the Charleston story. And my mother's family is the New Orleans uh, story. And my, my grandmother was the daughter of a white man and a, a woman of color, born in 1890 in New Orleans. And, um, and so I grew up in Los Angeles, which is a large Creole community, is a large Creole population that, you know, from the westward migration of mixed race, light skinned, straight haired, you know, black folks, like you see uh, a group in, you know, a, a significant part of the New Orleans population. But the way you tell the story of your great, great grandfather, it's almost as if that kind of interracial intimacy could not exist, but it did. And it, so how does that fit into the way you think think about the New Orleans uh, interracial story. Right. It's a complicating fact of Louisiana history that, uh, that interracial, interracial families were prolific in, in New Orleans. And everyone knows that. And um, what happened um, at the end of Reconstruction was that when white supremacy reasserted itself and, the, and Re Reconstruction was brought to an end and the Klan won, if you like, uh, a, a, more, um, a more severe racial segregation was imposed and Creoles of color were pushed into the category of black society and white and black society was um, set in concrete. Um, but during the, uh, during the early 1800s, right through till 1880, uh, there, there was uh, pro promiscuous, you know, interracial sex. Some of it commercial, some of it um, uh, quid pro quo. Um, perhaps some of it romantic, and all of it giving us uh, this multicolored society in the in the circle of the people that I write about, my great-great-grandfather and his circle, who are most of them working class manual laborers who have lost um, some of their white entitlement. It appears that uh, interracial sex is less a part of their everyday ken. It appears in retrospect that interracial sex was conducted by prosperous white men uh, and who found companions, who purchased companions and who persuaded companions among women of color. Um, and it appears that working class white Southerners, such as the Lacorns of that day, were not um, so much a part of that that uh, tradition. Tradition, if you can call it that. Yeah, I wonder about that. Uh, challenge you a little bit on that because okay. 
uh, you know, and and also that uh, someone who is a is a carpenter is a work. He's a craftsman. You know, I, I think that they would probably differentiate a little bit more on that. Uh, yeah. But uh, that um, there were there were families that were not recognized by law, but still would be. Uh, and this was certainly the case in Charleston and in New Orleans and in Mobile. So I'm just, you know, I, 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 I think I give you a little bit of my sense is that uh, the, the men compartmentalized more. Yeah, they could be they could be sexually and emotionally attracted to a woman of color. But they could see her not as their equal. Right. That's true. And that actually that was, uh, you know, in their notion of caste, that that was more her appropriate role. And, 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 you know, and she should be thankful for it. And that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I just wonder whether it's a little bit more nuanced than, than, than that, because I don't believe that, you know, if you, you know, I had two great grand, two great, great grandfathers in Charleston. One was, uh, you know, a planter class and the other one was Irish. And yeah. he owned the shipyard, you know, and he, they both had three women of color as their spouses and they treated them as their wives and they left them property, uh, you know, but uh, they both were Confederates, yeah. one in the Navy and one of them was a, you know, was a, a gun runner. So, you know, I mean, you just, they, they, I'm wondering whether New Orleans had that. I didn't get that sense in your storytelling that you made room for. Right. The uh, relationships that did become more intimate. Yeah. And, and long standing. And long standing. And long standing. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, you do some, tell some stories about some of the uh, Creoles of color who then also did something which, you know, is pretty well known in the South, and that is they passed for white and they stayed in New Orleans and passed for white. Right. So everybody who claims to be white in New Orleans may not, in fact, be white. Right. Yeah. A lot of folks who, who wanted to pass left New Orleans and went to to New York or Los Angeles, as you know, or Chicago or what have you. Hey, but let's get um, <clears throat> get on the table a couple of the provocations in this book. OK. Um, one is that it's my view that about half of white Americans can claim a Klansman in the family tree. Approximately one half of white Americans can claim a Klansman in the family tree. And I'll tell you how I come to that uh, startling number. The Ku Klux flourished after the Civil War for about 12 years when it won the battle that it started and Reconstruction ended. It goes out of business. 50 years later, the Ku Klux Klan is reborn in 1915 after the making of a, a film called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. And that is the era when we see the white robe and white hood uh, become the trademark of Klan activity. And at that point, the Klan attracts millions of followers all over the country. Dues paying membership is about four to five million in 1925, members of membership in the Klan. Now, if you take five million Klansmen in 1925 and you just count four to 100 years, their grandchildren and great grandchildren, by a simple demographic uh, equation, amount to about 135 million white people, which is to say 135 million today white people who are descended from Klansmen of the 19 teens and 20s, which is one half of the population of white America, 270 million. Now, most white Americans don't know this uh, and perhaps they do not wish to know, but it's not a, a matter of saying um, clan values, clan activity is something over there. It's something those people did. In fact, it may be that 
the more healthy and right-minded approach is to take ownership of this inheritance and say, this is actually part of our family history and memory. Um, and so that's one thing I'm trying to do is to take ownership of a difficult part of family history that has obviously distorted and, de and deformed our social unity and progress. It's it obviously, it has poisoned the, um, the dream of shared um, participation in, in the economic and political life of the country. And I think it's, it's, it's good to take ownership. So that's one thing it, uh, that's on my mind. Edward, um, along those lines, uh, we have a question from Alexandra Lee asking, uh, how has your research uh, affected your perception of your family? Well, it is certainly complicated. <clears throat> complicated it. Um, there's a question behind that question, I think, which is how does your family feel about the- Yeah. The right? <laughs> yeah. Do you get invited to Thanksgiving dinner? That's the question. Well, this is COVID time, right? <laughs> Thanksgivings have been suspended. Michael, so come. <laughs> Nobody in my, my family in New Orleans number is about 40 or 50. And um, nobody in the family has tried to stand in my way about doing this research. One reason is that this figure, Constant Le Corn, that I've taken from our family tree has been obscured by time. He's not a person that um, people talk about He's not a person people know much about in the family narrative. And I've had to construct his life and memory. So it's, it's, uh, it's, whereas when I was writing Slaves in the Family more than 20 years ago about my father's family who were major slaveholders in South Carolina having enslaved 4,000 people. Um, the story of the plantations and the, um, the, the grand manner of my father's family, which had been passed down through the generations, was one embraced by many people in the family. And, and um, because I was trying to rewrite that story at the time, it uh, was upsetting to a number of people who, who took it to their heart as a story about white people only. <clears throat> so my family in New Orleans, everybody's cool. Everybody's cool. <laughs> How has it affected my view of the family? Well, uh, I think if you peel back, you know, so many people do genealogy these days and so many traditionally will do genealogy in order to find some uh, esteemed predecessor who's, who's the light of whose radiance can be shined down on the present and you can take part in the memory of it's such an interesting or wealthy or well-behaved or... Uh, and this is a kind of genealogy which I have done um, that looks at the criminals in the family tree and looks at their crimes. And uh, I think if you peel back any family, just one layer, you will find a host of interesting contrary stories that run headlong into events of history with a capital H. And um, so Edward, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, yes, there are, there are 135 million white Americans who, uh, if they knew their family history, they would find a Klansman or a white supremacist in the 19th century. 
<clears throat> but I thought the 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 other element of your story, your book, that was uh, you know is the institutions and the yeah. enterprises that are esteemed in New Orleans that have uh, deep roots in the this. So you know the Catholic Church, yeah. the uh, Tulane University or the universities, I think it was Tulane that was where some of the pseudoscientists were operating just as Louis Agassiz was operating at Harvard. Um, the, uh, and you know, probably you know, the institutions that most Americans know best and that is the crews of Mardi Gras. And uh, so the crew of Comus uh, does not come off really well in this as you know, uh, you know with uh, and I don't remember whether it was even the crew of Comus. I know that you talked about one of the crews in a Memphis Mardi Gras that did reenactments of lynchings on the, as the crew went, you know, through. So how, how do, have you, is there an opportunity for, for, you know, recognition and reconciliation among some of those esteemed institutions of New Orleans, if not the individual, you know, citizens of the community? Yeah. Well, as, as you know, Michael, a number of universities are undertaking a period of self-study with regard to their relationship with the institution of enslavement, uh, such as Georgetown University in outside of Washington, DC, which in the 1840s sold 270 of its enslaved workers down the river, as they say, to New Orleans, from which they were dispersed to cotton and sugar plantations around the South. And uh, Georgetown is coming to terms with this history in various ways. Um, and, I, and Yale University here in New Haven is undertaking self-study and Brown University and Princeton and a number of other, et cetera. So it's, I think that this kind of um, reckoning is, is uh, real and ongoing and it's flourishing now in a contrary context. One is surprised to see on the one hand, the flourishing of white supremacist paramilitary activity, which is, um, which is practically uh, national in scope. At the same time, there are institutions uh, that are trying to come to terms with their history with regard to um, slavery and, and Jim Crow. Um, so yeah, I, I see it. I see it uh, in a metaphorical way. White supremacy is is an is like an underground river that flows through U.S. history, out of sight, but it waters the roots of institutions. And throughout the generations, it has fed the roots of institutions. And occasionally, it erupts in geysers of violence. But before returning underground. So some handful and dozens of institutions uh, are trying to come to terms with things that are hard to look at and I, and I encourage it. About New Orleans and Mardi Gras, it would strike anybody coming to Mardi Gras for the first time to look upon the men throwing from throwing um, beads from the floats in their hoods and robes. It would strike anyone on first viewing that there is an uncanny similarity between the uh, disguises of, of, uh, of the carnival uh, celebrators and the disguises of the marauding um, uh, militias of, of the old days. And, uh, and I think if you look up, at, I don't want to get onto the subject of Comus 
in particular, but <clears throat> uh, the roots of Comus are interlocked with the roots of, um, of Reconstruction racial violence. They are uh, quite, um, they are quite implicated in, uh, in the, the race violence of the time. And, you know, uh, I know we're coming to the, to the end of our hour together, but uh, yeah. I, I would just like to say, um, as someone who, this is your third book that I've read. And um, I just have found you to be one, a wonderful writer. Uh, you get seduced if you haven't read this into the narrative and the story and the lives of the people you're telling about. And, um, and such a courageous writer, I mean, uh, uh, to confront history, to interrogate it, and it's not somebody else's history, it's your own. Um, and then to, um, you know, to have your own reconciliation with that. So I, as a, as a fan, I just wanna thank you for yet another powerful uh, book. And I hope that uh, more folks will read it and uh, think about it enjoy it because it's a powerful book. It's a hard one to put down. You don't want to do that. But it's also just uh, a very important one. And thank you for adding to your library of very important works. Thank you, Michael. You're very kind. And I appreciate your taking time to talk to me and, and our group. Thank you all for uh, walking this path with us tonight. Britain. Pleasure. Uh, I don't know if you want to do another question or two, or if we should end it now. But uh, no, but I, I wanted to make sure I said that before. Uh, right. You know, before we cut us off. So if anybody's got a question, yeah, let's stick with it. Let me see here. One from David Christie uh, says, Did, "Does the overt historical racism in the South stand a better chance of reconciliation than the covert <laughs> racism of the North that is no less prevalent?" Mm. Michael, what do you think of that? Hmm. I, I, you know, I'm here in Georgia and I'm looking at, you know, uh, uh, people of a lot of different backgrounds coming together and saying, uh, we're going to change some things in this community and we're going to, this, this state, and we're going to be, uh, and we're going to do it together. So I, you know, I, I, you know, we've been, through, this has been such a weird last four years in, or plus, so, you know, it's kind of hard just to predict anything. Uh, except that uh, I, I will say this, if you didn't think civic engagement and the role of citizenship was important before, you certainly do think it is now. <laughs> and voter suppression means a whole lot more today than it used to mean in the past. And, uh, you know, we're all here together. So let's just find a way to make it. I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm more optimistic today than I was a year ago. Well, I am too more optimistic today than a year ago. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, yeah, go ahead. Um, oh. no, I live in both places. I live in New Orleans part time and I live up in Philadelphia. And just as a regular person, not a writer, um, in observation <laughs> of that, answering his question, um, I think it is really not acknowledged up north particularly among people, uh, women of white. Um, the, it, it's much more, um, it's more, it continues to be more covert up in the North as it always has been. And I don't, living in both places and seeing it, I haven't, I, I agree Philadelphia voted and went over the top, et cetera, the same thing that you had in Atlanta, but I still don't see I still see it as covert and less acceptance that it was even there to begin with, or that they even have it when they are approached by it, particularly yeah. white women. So. Yeah, there is a <clears throat> there is a catchphrase now coming from sociology, which is un, 
uh, implicit, what is it called? Implicit racism? Is that what, is that? Implicit, implicit bias. bias. Bias, yeah, this is a, a now a catchphrase that circulates through um, corporate consulting and, and other areas. I, I uh, find it more uh, accurate to talk about unconscious racism and unconscious racial identity. I believe that there is a lot to be learned from the examination of the processes of the unconscious mind among both whites and blacks. And, <clears throat> and it may be true that in the North, white women are less uh, willing to uh, entertain their um, own racial um, prejudice. It may be true. Uh, it may also be true that there is a kind of majority white racial identity that has worked its way like oil into the the mind of tens of millions of people across the country. And, you know, the great successes of the civil rights movement 50 years ago, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the, the beginnings of affirmative action, which had a good long life before it has begun to be crippled by various uh, challenges. Those successes many of them came from the top down through legislation and policy coming in the cascade out of Washington and, and uh, all praise to those victories. But I think that the, um, the path forward in racial reconciliation, if I can use that tired phrase, is going to be a person to person, one individual at a time, self understanding uh, from the ground up. And it, it will, it will uh, show that the legislative victories of the civil rights movement were comparatively easily won next to the one person at a time kind of revelation of racial identity that, that is going to be required. Michael? Yes. Um, as a New Orleans native and a member of one of the oldest Mardi Gras balls in New Orleans, and being a psychiatrist who's worked in New Orleans and in northern Louisiana among some of the more rural areas, I'm not as sanguine as you are. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think Edward's exactly right. I think this is going to be sort of a one-on-one, a -on -one, very, very slow road to go. But again, hope springs eternal. Um, this will be a new four years. I, I, I've got my fingers crossed, and I hope you're right. But um, it, it's my, my last 10 years of experience has left me um, more doubtful and disappointed than I wish I were. Great talk, Edward. I got to go to family. Tell your family I said hi, okay? All right. Thanks, man. Talk to you. Bye. 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 Uh, we have a question from uh, one of our locally esteemed historians, uh, Lawrence Powell, he asked, uh, how do you account for the periodical erup eruptions of white supremacy? You know, I, I, I don't know what the special chemical compound is <laughs> that causes the geyser of white su supremacy to erupt <clears throat> periodically, but I think if you look case by case at the, over the generations, it is often reactive. Uh, the return of the third wave of the Klan that comes alive in the 1950s and 60s reacts to 
um, the renewed attempt of African Americans to en enhance citizenship. And uh, the first wave of the Ku Klux is a reaction. It's a, it's a kind of um, almost um, uh, involuntary reaction uh, out of fear. And it's, uh, it's, it sees, it finds an enemy, an enemy and sets itself on that enemy. And I wish I could explain what special uh, chemistry causes it to happen. Uh, I don't think I can, but I, I, I do set some store beside this idea of the, for every success in um, black uh, entitlement and black economic independence, there is white supremacy finds a way of becoming more sophisticated. Uh, voter suppression becomes, you know, the the response to the enfranchisement of ten million black people, voter suppression. Um, and uh, so there is something reactive about it. I'll, I'll answer that too, that I think it's, it's, it is not just a reaction to the enfranchisement, but it's a reaction to the assertive self-determination of black people. Absolutely. So it's, it, some of the words that get used in the late 19th century in this 1860s to through 1870s, the impudence, the, uh, the uh, you know, it's, it's both impudence and it is, you know, just, I, I, the, the words that you would find to, to describe the sense of, it's not just they're horrified by it, but, but they are, um, just, I, my, my, I'm, I'm, it's been a long day and I, my words aren't good, but I mean, it's just revolted by the notion that black people would think that they could be equal, that they could do these things, the impudent, put them back in their place, put them back in their cages. And I mean, some of the language is just really quite remarkably, uh, you know, terrible. And, you know, and, and, and as someone who's, lived, you know, three score and 10, and I've seen various iterations of this up cl close and personal in the deep south and elsewhere. It is a sense that you are invading my world and my, my rights and my humanity by even suggesting that you should be here. Yeah. And I, you know, I think some of this is clearly was a reaction to Obama, but it was also you know, even before Obama, it was what enabled an Obama to be, you know, that, that was like, I got to go, you know, and that that unleashed some of this. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Sure. Lawrence, did you want to say something or were you going to just send us a note? Beg your pardon? Laura, Mr. Powell. Oh, I see. Right. He sent us a note. Okay, so it's okay. No, I, I, I uh, you know, you sometimes feel as though we've time traveled back to reconstruction and redemption and, and you even see the animation of a kind of Wormley house bargain with, with Wall Street and big business weighing in and uh, uh, calling Trump to uh, a come to Jesus meeting, so to speak. So it's, you know, there's some deep rhythms here, and I think uh, Edward has done a brilliant job of, uh, through this time travel, through the catacombs of his family history, uh, to remind us how intimate the connection is between the life we live today, or the, the, the present, as well as the past, which is, use a cliche of uh, Faulkner, is really, really not, not even the past anymore, or never was. And it's, uh, you know, for a historian, it's really, it's really, it's one of an out-of-body experience to 
be living through a history that's happening to you when you're used to writing about it with some distance and and where this all ends, I don't know. The only the reason I asked that question of Edward about how do you explain the these periodic eruptions from this underground current of white supremacy, which I've always seen as a kind of a low grade fever that flares up under certain circumstances. And, and I, I come back to the the economic anxieties of the time too. It's when you feel that you're losing your your place in the world. You know, we've been so accustomed to indoctrination and the conditioning of white supremacy to believing that there and thinking that no matter how far we fall, there's always going to be a, a floor under self-esteem. We're never we're not going to fall so far as to as black folk. And when you could juxtapose that with the you know the demonstrable success of a of a new black middle class as exemplified by, you know, this, this classically brilliant and graceful president we had in, in Obama. You can see why this would be very unsettling for, for white people of a certain generation. But anyway, uh, hats off to Edward because this, I read this book in manuscript and I'm still, some of it still haunts me, so. Mm. It was a very, it was a big treat to, uh, to, to be exposed to it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. It's good to be with you. Hey, Edward, there's one literary connection that I wanted to make for you. And that is in PBS Pinchback, who is a character in your, uh, you know, the Lieutenant governor who becomes yep. the governor who then is elected to the Senate and they refuse to seat him. Right. And he spends two years. Uh, I don't know whether you know that he was the grandfather of Gene Toomer. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. The the Harlem Renaissance writer. I didn't know that. And, uh, it was and it back? The, uh, the classic book, Cain. Right. But just to, to understand as well, you know, Gene Toomer did not, who was like his grandfather, very fair skinned and looked almost white, looked white. Uh, he did fade into Bucks County, Pennsylvania became a doctor. And, uh, and uh, his descendants, who would still be uh, the descendants of Creole of color, PBS Benchback, you know, are living uh, the Quaker life in, in, in Bucks County. But you might want to read that because uh, uh, Toomer <laughs> writes so, so mystically about yeah. race he does indeed and also about the violence of race and just you know another just a footnote on pbs pinchback uh, who i always knew as the grandfather <laughs> of teen tumor and you reminded me he was you know the guy who couldn't get a seat in the senate because they wouldn't uh count his votes in louisiana well listen Britton, because um michael and Larry Powell have uh, shown themselves to be a pub personal publicist on my behalf, and they've been saying such nice things about it. I think this is an appropriate time. Yeah, it's such a nice place to, to stop our, our wonderful conversation. Uh, really have enjoyed this tonight, uh, Michael, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And Edward, thank you for writing such an amazing book. Uh, very powerful and uh, you know, look forward to many more uh, purchases of the book at the bookstore. Uh, yeah. And when this um, when this epidemic retreats, I'm coming to New Orleans and I'm going to bother you all. Good, good. <laughs> so everyone, uh, really appreciate everyone attending tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank and you. farewell. Right. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you, Edward. Good to see you, Michael.